All right, we got Elliot from Marine Collectors here today. He's gonna give us the top 10 fish keeping tricks. Yeah, these aren't your normal top 10 of tricks actually, because Elliot's got a couple decades in uh, caring for fish and providing healthy fish to people. So these are things that uh, I would actually say most people don't know or should know. Mm -hmm. Start with number one, an isolation box. Yeah. Okay, why would anybody want it? And what does it look like? Uh, why you want it whenever you get a new fish, it's a great time to just have the fish be separate from the rest of the um, fish in the tank. That way you can get it feeding and get it adjusted. You can let the other fish visually acclimate to it. You're not gonna have this all of a sudden fish gets dropped in, all the other tank mates just rush, aggression, you know, it's stressed out, doesn't know where all the hides are. Um, it's just a box that you can isolate the fish in. It's exactly what it sounds like. Okay, so when you first told me to do this, uh, I went and put some fish in the box, right? I think it was actually those little yellow anthias, the mm -hmm. Hawaiian anthias mm -hmm. the first time. Okay, I put them in there and I let them live in there for like, I think it was like two months. Yeah, uh, right? it was a good amount of time because yeah, they were tiny. Tiny, they would get yeah, swallowed yeah. by somebody. <laughs> uh, okay, so I had an epiphany though while I did this is like, where has this been all my life? Mm -hmm. Like, why have I not used one of these before? Because all the acclimation boxes that you buy are tiny little boxes that really couldn't support the yeah. animals for a prolonged period of time. It needs to be a little bigger. Yeah. Where's it been? Why does nobody use these things? Because it changes the trajectory. Like think of all the tangs that would be saved. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. Personally, I think it's just one of those things that you want to see the fish in the tank. You want to see it swimming around. You want to see it interacting with the other fish. You're just excited to get it in there. Um, I think it might just come down to patience personally. Uh, like I know that when I get a new fish out of quarantine, I'm like, oh my God, I got to get it in there, you know? And uh, sometimes it's just, I guess something overlooked, but as you, uh, I guess, develop more with the hobby, it's just one of those things that you pick up, you realize it's like, oh, okay, no, I should do that. That's what's best for the animal. You know, it's going to save me in the long run. It'll give me a chance to get that fish eating well, adjusted to water quality, feeding schedule, etc. It's all of those things. Because the first thing that comes to mind for me is that you drop a tang in there and the rule is you can't put a tang in. But we actually did it this morning. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> so you can't put another tang in there, there's other tangs in there because you're going to get attacked, right? Okay, well, yeah, it's true. If you just drop them in there, man, they're mm -hmm. going to go after them and they're going to be mad, yeah. you know? However, if you put them in this isolation box and let them live in there for a few weeks, uh, mm -hmm. when you let them go, they usually do a little bit of a dance and then it's all over. Yeah. You know? I mean, the thing that I like to think about is that if you, I mean, aside from aggression, right? If you have a new fish and it's stressed and maybe uh, you want to have it be isolated in a confined space where you can kind of baby that fish a little bit, gives that fish a lot better chance of surviving because let's just say you have something sensitive uh, you know, maybe it's something that doesn't ship well, or, you know, maybe it's just a fish that doesn't feed as aggressively as your other fish that have been in there for a long time. It's a good time to actually be able to just spot feed that fish, get it really, really aggressive feeding, or maybe just recover from shipping and then let it out. I think of, so today what we did is we released the zebra tank, mm -hmm. right? So he was getting harassed in a different tank and we decided in the 715 decided to move him over to the 360. Okay, so uh, in there already, though, is a yellow tang and a giant Achilles tang. Yeah, and the uh, gem tank, too. And the gem tang. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there's one other tank, too, the white tail. I yeah, think. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I, I can tell you that he was going to get attacked in there for sure, and he was not in a good state. His fins were all nipped up, and he's mm -hmm. skinny because the other the tanks were harassing him in the other tank. But I just let him go, dude. He was a goner. And I know that yeah. because the isolation box originally, one of the magnets <laughs> fell off and he, uh -huh. he got loose. And man, was he getting beat up like immediately. Really? It happened like day two. We were able to capture him and put him back in the isolation mm -hmm. box and put him up there. Explain what you saw today when we let him go. Okay, so uh, your Achilles immediately went after him, as you would probably expect. Achilles, they're <laughs> Achilles, you know, they're relatively aggressive fish. Um, but there's a difference between... Uh, like hierarchical maintenance and aggression that's going to lead to the fish dying. Um, like uh, we saw earlier, the fish changed color. You know, the Achilles almost turned white, eyes turned blue. Um, it's more of like an agitated state, but he was more coming over, sizing him up. It wasn't so much tearing his fins apart, you know, swiping at him with that uh, tail spine. Mm -hmm. um, very different. A lot of times when you put a fish in there and immediately your other fish might come up to it and, you know, start chasing it around. It's not really that bad. 
It's just learning to know when it's like, okay, I need to let it play out because they just need to figure out who's boss and you know what that hierarchy is going to be versus, okay, that fish is going to kill this other new one. I need to actually step in and remove it. I'm to the point now where I think almost any fish that I'd add to a new tank, I would put it in the isolation box for a few weeks because mm -hmm. like uh, anything that wouldn't, wouldn't be harmed by doing that. Yeah. I would put that in there because it's like almost like a surefire thing that it's going to go well when you let it go, mm -hmm. you know, and they're going to do the little dance you talked about. It's going to look a little scary, but you're not going to see him actually tearing his fins off mm -hmm. or anything like that. And to the point that I actually had this discussion with uh, Victor when he was here uh, mm -hmm. a while ago, a few months ago, and we discussed the isolation box and he had the same reaction, which is like, yeah, where is this pen all of our life? <laughs> Why is this not like a standard component of how we do it? You know, the number one reason is I think because they don't sell them. Hmm. Like, no, you can't just buy this. Yeah. It's a DIY it's project. A, definitely a DIY type of thing. Yeah. Uh, We'll, we'll share in another video here, uh, mm -hmm. hopefully we're gonna share it today actually, a little <laughs> bit more about how you do one of those DIY projects. But uh, in the short term, you know, it's just building a glass, a little plastic yeah, box. Something to isolate it. I mean, the really, really simple way that I used to do it is actually just get a sheet of acrylic, uh, something a little bit thicker, just so it's not warping in the flow. Um, electrical tape it in the corner, just drill a couple holes, that way uh, there's a good amount of water getting in there, but it's really all, you need, I you mean, probably just use isolating some, a section of the tank. You could probably just wedge, go to Home Depot, get a plastic sheet, mm -hmm. drill a couple holes in it, wedge it in the corner, and then use like a couple of magnet cleaners to hold the blades oh, yeah. almost. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it doesn't have to That'll be super advanced. Obviously, mm -hmm. don't bump your magnet corners. <laughs> All right, so uh, number two, like if you didn't listen to anything, man, today, listen to number one. Get yourself an isolation yeah, yeah. box. Mm -hmm. It'll go so much better for you. Uh, but number two here, is proper acclimation. What is the trick related to that? Okay, so uh, marine collectives work exclusively online, which means we ship a lot of fish. Uh, I personally think that the majority of the time that fish don't do well, it's probably because they weren't acclimated properly. Um, I've seen both ends where people just throw the fish right in and not acclimate at all, or they'll acclimate too long and the fish will end up suffocating because it didn't have enough oxygen and aeration. Um, happy medium is usually like if you're getting a fish from the store, uh, 30 minutes floating it, 30 minutes fast drip, you could even just take a piece of airline tubing and let it full siphon. Um, usually I like to let it uh, triple in volume then keep the lights off for the rest of the day. Um, for a fish that's shipped, honestly, it could really be the same thing. Um, for fish that get delayed though, Usually I'll tell people that they need to float them for like three, four or five hours and not open the bag. Um, usually if you have a fish that gets delayed, you wanna rush, open the bag, get it out of the bag because you think it might be running out of oxygen. Most of the time that's not the case. We've actually had fish get delayed for like a week and a half and still arrive alive. You told me about the Harlan couldn't oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, a last, week and a half in Fedrex. Yeah, there, it, it's still alive. Last year, we uh, we sent the Harlequin Tusk, and for whatever reason, the like tracking email went to this customer's junk folder, and then the FedEx facility that had the box called us and like, hey, this box has been here. It says live fish on it. Like, do you want us to throw it away? Like, it's been here for like a week and a half. And I was like, what? Called the customer. I'm like, dude, you need to go pick it up. He's like, well, you know, I don't think it's going to be alive. I don't want to deal with them. Like, just go pick it up chances are it'll probably be alive because like we packed the fish meant for delays sure enough it was still alive i told him okay float the bag four or five hours do a fast drip leave the lights off if you can put them in an isolation box fish was fine okay i'm just gonna say it because it's it's true uh <laughs> most of the places i bought online from uh put as much little uh, water uh, and as small a bag as humanly possible because overnight shipping is expensive, mm -hmm. right? And like the number one reason that those businesses <laughs> uh, don't last that long is because overnight shipping is expensive. Mm -hmm. And so they have to put as little water in as possible. So in this case, you know, if you're buying, uh, I've gotten shipments from you, yeah. uh, they're bigger. The, there's a lot of water in there yeah. and there's a lot of oxygen well, in there. So the thing is, I mean, we're a little bit different just because we're putting so much time into the fish that so we pack the fish a little bit differently. Like we make all of our bags ourselves. We heat seal the corners just so that it'll conform to the inside of the box better, hmm. maximize the space. Um, but 
The majority of the time that the fish is going to not do well in the bag is usually when you open the bag and there's nothing to prevent the ammonia from burning the fish and its gills. And that's usually what compromises the fish, not so much that the fish was running out of oxygen. That's an important part actually with acclimation because a lot of people probably don't know this, but mm -hmm. uh, what happens is the ammonia will build up in that bag, but also what's building up is uh, carbon dioxide mm -hmm. and so the pH is going low. But at a low pH, the ammonia actually isn't all uh, that toxic. And so when I actually start doing the acclimation mm -hmm. and uh, open up the bag and start some gas exchange, the pH goes up and all of a sudden the ammonia becomes uh, like ionized uh, toxic ammonia. Uh, remember, okay, so there was a while ago when uh, I was asking you what you thought would happen if I just opened a bag that had been delayed for a long time, really, really low pH, right? And just re it, didn't let any of the uh, outside air in, but only pure oxygen if the pH would change. For some reason it didn't. Mm -hmm. Absolutely like mind blowing fine. I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> this is <laughs> so cool because sometimes, you know, we get fish from overseas. They might be in transit for like three days sometimes, you know, if they get delayed or whatever it is. Um, and there's always the risk of like, okay, how are we gonna open the bags? Because a lot of times the fish are coming with medication in the water. You can't put an ammonia blocker. Um, and what do you do? Right, but you don't want the fish to suffocate either, you know, and there's obviously you want to change the water. Um, and what we found is like, we will uh, open the bags, or sorry, not open the bags, but untie the bags, squeeze the air that's in there out, re it with pure oxygen so no outside gas is actually exchanging, uh, leave the fish overnight, and then come back in the morning, then do a, a slow acclimation, actually change the water out, and they do substantially better. And then you don't have to worry about pH shooting up and the fish getting ammonia burn. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you how I generally do it and you're gonna tell me why <laughs> this is wrong. Uh, but like, I have learned some of those lessons in the past where, uh, you know, you thought slower was better. Mm -hmm. uh, it turned out not to be the case. And so, and I, like, you don't really do the math and what you're doing to you have this slow little drip. Oh, okay, yeah. but like I floated it, I got the temp up to where it needs to be. Mm -hmm. Then I took it back out and I put it in a bucket and I'm slow dripping in it. And then the temperature is going back down to 70 degrees <laughs> or whatever the room's at at that yep. time. Like, so now I've changed the temperature again and then I'm going to turn the water over and then dump it back in. Like this sounds like bad news to me. So I don't know. It's, uh, it's also like the concept of like, do you put an air stone in the acclimation bucket? Do you not? Because if you don't have something in there to prevent the ammonia from burning the fish and the pH shoots up mm -hmm. too much aeration, will just speed that process up. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, you want to keep the amount of oxygen up. So if the fish hasn't been delayed and you're going to do a fast drip, just get the fish dripped 30, 40 minutes. Awesome. Get the fish in. It's not going to suffocate in that amount of time. But like I've heard people doing like eight, nine, 12 hours of dripping. It's like, if you don't have an air stone in there, that fish is gonna suffocate. There's not that much water in the packing bag. You know? no, it's not oxygen now on the yeah, top of it either. exactly. Okay, so this is what I usually do, or some version of this, is uh, when I get the fish, I will address how much water is in there mm -hmm. because it doesn't actually need all of that water that's in there in most cases, yeah. and I need to dilute it. So if it's like one of your bags, man, I got to remove some of it because there's so much water in there. <laughs> Other if I wanted to dilute it to, you know, 25% of what it is originally or, mm -hmm. or not dilute, dilute the differences in chemistry between what's in the bag and what's in the tank, yeah. right? If I wanted to do that, well, like I'd have to put so the bag, the bag's not big enough, right? Mm -hmm. So what I do is I reduce it down and then I'll try to double the water or I'll change 25% of the water. So if there was mm -hmm. a gallon in there, let's add you know roughly a quarter gallon of water yeah. in there and had it already temperature acclimated in 10 minutes at another quarter and another 10 minutes at another yeah. quarter until after a handful of these things i've turned over probably 75 percent mm -hmm. of the water and it's pretty similar chemistry to the tank and then get it into the acclimation yeah. box so i think isolation box yeah, yeah. Um, i think it's just one of those things where it's like if you know that the water that the fish is coming from it's not like there's not too many parameters that are going to be that dramatically different where it's going to matter and you need to do an extended drip. Um, the only extended acclimation that we do is usually if we're getting fish from overseas and it's like a really traumatic or sorry, dramatic change between the two parameters. You know, if it's like combination of salinity, pH, temperature, you know, we might take you know multiple days to acclimate those fish. But if it's just temperature, 
just pH and it's not that big of a change, it shouldn't take that long. Yeah, I, I find faster is better uh, mm -hmm. with my, my limited experience. Of, uh, <laughs> I, I've been doing this a long time, but I haven't touched as many fish as you have, yeah. right? Uh, so proper acclimation, uh, don't make it take forever unless it's, there's like a weird instance where mm -hmm. you really need to think about it. Uh, but also dump and pray, especially dump and pray without the isolation box has a, <laughs> a little bit lower uh, 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 outcome. Another top 10 here of number three is managing aggression. Yeah. Okay, so how, what are the tips on managing aggression? Uh, depends on what the fish is, but usually I like to come up with a plan uh, depending on what they are. For example, if it's a tang, you know, put all the same genus in at once, all the same size. Uh, maybe keep food in different spots of the tank. Um, if it's antheus, have one male per multiple females. If I know it's a more aggressive uh, species, I'll put an exuberant amount of females for the one male, like liar tails and bimax. If you do like a pair, usually the male will kind of just harass the female a lot more. Um, you know, it's just simple stuff like that, but it's more just do the research on the fish first and see what they need and what their temperament's like. Um, I think the concept or the philosophy that needs to be developed is more just, we should create a plan before we put the fish in there and make sure that the fish are going into a good environment opposed to just, I saw that really cool fish, I really want it, throw it in there, hope it works. <laughs> Uh, we are working on a plan to share some of that information on each one of these mm -hmm. fish, or uh, at least at least the popular ones, yeah. uh, so that uh, you don't have to wonder what the answer is to each one of those, because we could spend all day on it uh, as we sit here today already. Uh, <laughs> but uh, managing aggression. Let's just pretend, though, for a, a couple of examples here, like uh, I didn't put all my tangs in at once, which is the right way to do it, by mm -hmm. the way, if you're going to... I mean, people tell you all the time, like, don't add too many fish at once. If you're going to do tangs, man, do them, plan the whole thing out yeah. and do them all at once, way higher outcome. But uh, let's say I didn't do that and I want to add these tangs later. <laughs> and like, for what it, let's, let's say I'm going to royally mess this up, yeah. which is uh, I'm going to add one that is the same size and species mm -hmm. as the other ones. Like, how do I manage all this stuff? So it's not impossible. Um, a while ago, God, that was probably almost eight years ago now, uh, I set up this 80 gallon tank uh, and it was originally run as a bio pellet experiment tank just to see if they work well. Um, but it was all tangs and there was something like 20 something tangs in an 80 gallon tank. And don't do that. It's just purely for experimental purposes. Um, and you know, I'm in a particularly unique situation where I can always rehome the fish. But um, there are fish coming in and out of that system all the time. You know, if I had uh, Achilles and powder blues and gold rims and I wanted to put another one in there, usually what I would do is I would put one that's either substantially smaller or substantially bigger. That would be ideal because usually the same size doesn't work. Whoever the dominant one of the tank uh, is, is usually going to just go after that fish incessantly. Um, if I can't do that and they are the same size and they are the same genus, usually I'll do something like I will uh, put that fish, the new one, in the isolation box for a week, two weeks, let them visually acclimate. And then the one that I know is the most aggressive of that group that's in the tank already, I'll catch him out, put him into isolation, put the new one in. Mm. That way the new one can get adjusted, see where everything is before he has to deal with the harassment from the aggressive one. Number four, a stocking plan and curation. Yeah, it's funny because I didn't usually always do this. I was very much, uh, I would set up a tank and I would be like, wow, well, you know, I don't know what fish I want because I want them all, uh, but I'll figure it out as time goes on. Um, but in the past five years or so, I've realized that it's much, much better to just have the plan, figure out what fish you're gonna be keeping because then you can design the tank around it. Um, like you know that I have a lot of deep water fish. Most of those tanks are dimly lit, lots of overhangs, not a ton of flow. They're also a little bit cooler. Um, you know, just depending on what's gonna be in there, you should be able to design the habitat that you're gonna keep those fish in around them. Okay, so here's the, the like hanger and all this mm -hmm. is, uh, 
nobody did that the first time or very few people. Oh, yeah. I guess I did. Uh, for, <laughs> I, you know what it was? I wanted to maximize the amount of fish I could put in this thing. And so I was really trying to calculate it before I did anything. But uh, so maybe I was doing it, but maybe for the wrong reason. Uh, but in this case, I think that this is one of those things that probably everybody should do is a stocking plan and creation no. because it's actually an opportunity for you to go to the fish store and instead of treating these pets like impulse buys, mm -hmm. which like the nature of the fish store's existence is impulse buy. I went there to buy carbon knowing full well, man, I'm hoping that something catches my eye while I'm there. Yeah. Like I'm literally hoping that something forces me to open my wallet while I'm there. You know what though? I think that's part of the excitement of like getting into the hobby. It's going to the fish store and like getting excited about the things that you see and the things that you're gonna be able to keep one day. Um, I think the only key difference there is, you know, just a little bit of patience because, you know, then you can put all the, uh, infrastructure there that you need to keep that animal alive and healthy opposed to putting it there first and then trying to figure it afterwards. I think there's actually an opportunity here for the fish store uh, and the curation element of, mm -hmm. yeah, the first time, man, we're just all, the, probably the impulse thing is, is just real. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, like As you say it though, man, getting a pet as an impulse buy just sounds like a terrible idea yeah. and it I mean, sounds like it's going to have a low dog, outcome, right? you know? Yeah. I don't buy a dog though, like based on impulse in most cases, right? Yeah. I had planned in my giving, bringing a, having a dog in my family. I didn't like mm -hmm. go to a store and there's a puppy, like, ah, oh, let's bring her home, you know? <laughs> uh, it's, it's not the same thing. So, but in this case, I think there's an opportunity for the store, man, because the store could sit down with you and actually go through mm -hmm. like, okay, you got a 120 gallon tank. Tell me like the top five fish in here that you love and you really, yeah. really would like to have in here. And then, you know, I could actually help suggest some other cool ones that would go along mm -hmm. with this that you might like. And then we can build out the plan and I can actually order these fish in sequence so they're ready yep. for you when you need them. Uh, and we can curate the whole process for you, which is great for the store because they're selling fish now. Mm -hmm. uh, and great for you because you're <laughs> adding them in the intelligent way. And the whole process is curated to something that you're really happy about. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, I think about actually like uh, if you're like building a house or whatever, you know, like you have a design person to like help you go through the process. Because yeah. if you're just picking all your own stuff, man, the place is going to be a disaster. Uh, you know, like you've never <laughs> done this before, man. This is the first year, uh -huh. first rodeo. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The next one here is, uh, I don't know how this is a good one. Number uh, five, if you doubt, don't. Ah, uh, yeah, that's just good advice. Uh, I mean, it just kind of goes into if you don't know anything about the fish and you don't know if it's going to work out, don't buy it. <laughs> like, uh, you know, it's so at marine collectors, we curate tons of fish for people. And people are always like, oh, you know, just tell me what fish to buy. And I'm like, no, you should do the research, figure out what fish you want. You're going to be the one taking care of it. You know, uh, I don't want to tell you to get this fish then you not be happy with its care requirements just because it looks pretty. You should, should like figure out what the um, you know actual necessities of that fish is to thrive, not just survive, you know, to care for it long term, not just for now, um, you know, before you actually put that animal in your tank. OK, so I've learned this uh, through my experience actually with you is uh, I tell you the things that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. Like I honestly always research about, you know, like what i don't have to do the research per se of like what are the care requirements of all yeah. of these fish i come to you with hey these are the fish that excite me mm -hmm. and then you tell me exactly why <laughs> some of this is stupid <laughs> right uh for instance i i i explored the conversation of trying uh uh twin spot gobies mm -hmm. again because this 360 sand bed has been around now for a couple of years yeah. it's a ton of sand i know how to feed them and I feel like I'm not going to put that damn six line in there again. It was a, a regression story. Uh, OK, so I'm thinking about this. And then your immediate response was, that's a bad idea with the tile fish. Yeah. Because uh, I have those arini tile fish in there. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's just if you've got fish that occupy similar territory and one's already established and one's definitely going to win the fight type of thing, like no competition is probably not a good idea. You know, those tile fish are what, like seven inches or so. Yeah. And the twin spot gobies are <laughs> inch long. Yep. Uh, you know, I mean, tile fish like to make burrows, or twin spot gobies like to make burrows. 
same territory. I could very well see those tilefish just going, pulling those gobies out, and eating them. Uh, you know, if it can fit in a fish's mouth, they'll probably eat it. Okay, so in this case, man, I doubt, man, so I'm not gonna, yeah. right? Uh, and, but you can, you know, have some of the, whatever your resource might be, and most fish stores should be able to tell you that. Uh, obviously, you could hit up Elliot and ask <laughs> as well if you want to curate a tank with him. But, uh, like, if you doubt, don't. It's actually a great idea yeah. because in most cases, man, you know what I've actually found from talking to you? Is that expert only is just garbage. And it's just like, all it needs to be is, if you're willing to do these three things, mm -hmm. then this fish is easy. Yeah. There are it's just very work. few. It's just work, you yep. know? It's just, uh, what does your schedule allow for, you know? If you're willing to do three things, all of them are easy. They don't just die, man. There's not yeah. some, you know, like, uh, this isn't a, like an orca that we're putting inside of a pool and wondering why it's not going well. Like these are reasonably big, you know, uh, 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 spaces of water. The water is generally mm -hmm. well cared for. There's plenty of nutrition. And they're not just keep kicking the bucket for no reason. Yeah. Or either it's aggression related, nutrition related, you know, chemistry or pollution in water uh, related. Mm -hmm. If we manage those things, you, you really should be able to keep almost anything. Yeah. Uh, some of them have really hard feeding requirements. Yeah. But do you want to do that is the question. It's, uh, it's funny because I think the majority of the time it's just, it's not understanding the fish. That's why they don't do well. Not so much that the fish is impossible to keep. We have actually an episode on that. Uh, keep an eye out for it, it's coming. <laughs> all right, number six, top 10 fish keeping tricks. Number six is not all fish are the same, meaning they are, might all be purple tangs, but they're not all purple tanks. <laughs> uh, so this is just kind of goes into the uh, realm of you know, all fish, they all have their own personalities. Um, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've had a customer tell me, you know, I've had a purple tang in the past and uh, it killed all my fish. Or the same thing about a yellow tang or a gem tang or something, right? A fish that maybe it has uh, an aggression uh, inclined to the species. But on the flip side, I've also heard the exact opposite. Oh, it won't come out and eat. It's super shy. It's super skittish, you know? Um, I think it really just plays to, you know, there's a lot of generalizations we can make about certain fish, uh, you know, just based off of their behavior, the type of habitat they occupy, um, and just like the fish uh, adhering to its uh, natural biology. But like, there are definitely scenarios where sometimes the mix of fish will work, sometimes they won't. Like you could definitely put uh, a powder blue and Achilles together most of the time. For some reason, that combination just works. But I've also seen it where the Achilles kills the one or the powder blue kills the other. You know, it doesn't always work. You know, it's just a best guess. And it's not uh, these like cookie cutter things that every time it's going to be the exact same. You know, what comes to mind for, for me is the word luck. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, and that luck is mm -hmm. what we've relied on so much for uh, our hobby, which is, you know, you go, can I put a purple tang and or a, a, an Achilles tang and a powder blue tang together? Yeah. And you'll like see in the forum or wherever you're at and there'll be like five people that that did not work out for me. Mm -hmm. And there'll be five people that say that worked out for me. And confirmation bias, I'm going to listen to five people that tell me what I want to hear, and then I'll go try it, right? Uh, okay, so instead, though, what if the feedback was, of course you can do it. This is the most high probability yeah. way to be successful doing it. So I think right? it's just... That's a totally uh, different thing. It's one of those things where you try to put the combination of all the best practices together in hopes of having the best result. Doesn't mean it's always going to work, um, but like let's just say you're gonna, let's use that Achilles and powder blue example, right? If you're going to do those two fish, you know, multiple feeding stations, acclimation box, isolation box, get them adjusted to each other, um, you know, have good amount of flow, et cetera, et cetera. The stuff that those fish need a lot of, um, better your odds. <laughs> better your odds is the right way because I, a lot of times these conversations get stuck in analysis paralysis because no way <laughs> is perfect, you know, and it just like goes in this endless cycle of debate and they're like, that way isn't perfect. I'm like, okay, well, that may be true, mm -hmm. but can we acknowledge no way is perfect? Yes. Can we acknowledge that this way has a way higher likelihood of success than the other way? Yes. Enough said. 
Yep. Right. So if I wanted to put these two aggressive fish together and the options were a man, if you wanted to do that, add them all together uh, in some cases, uh, if uh, if that isn't the case, then put them in the isolation box for, you know, uh, a month and then, mm -hmm. then let them go. It's very likely to, to work out much better. There's like a handful of things you could do to make sure that this goes well mm -hmm. rather than just you know, coin flip, maybe works, maybe doesn't work. There's five people that said it did, five people that didn't. Yeah. Hidden in there is actually the characteristics of the mm -hmm. animal. You know, fish aren't all the same, as you said, they have personalities. And then also there's ways to manage that. Mm -hmm. All right, next one, number seven. You know, this is something that actually, like, uh, as a, like a pet peeve of mine now, I wish that we could change this and hopefully as we sit here 10 years from now, we won't be talking about the same thing, but top 10 uh, fish keeping tricks is replicate the fish's natural diet. Mm -hmm. So what does that look like? Uh, I think it's more applicable to those so-called expert only fish or people or fish that uh, maybe people have difficulty keeping. It's just um, fish are opportunists. You know, the majority of the fish that we keep in aquariums, they will take tomises and pellets and flakes and whatever we want to feed them. Um, but the fish that are, you know, more difficult, so to speak, um, not that they actually are, but just that they might have uh, less tolerance of um, you know, different foods. You know, it's just a matter of adhering to, you know, let's find out what do they eat, like Moorish idols, right? They naturally eat a lot of fiber in the diet. The one that's in your 360, it's been doing great. Mm -hmm. And before that, you're like, oh no, you know, it's probably gonna die or something. Why but, are you send this to me? <laughs> yeah, I know. But it's been here for what, eight months, nine months now, and it's grown, it's probably doubled in size. Mm -hmm. um, you know. it's, just, it's just fiber, really. Yeah. Like, dude, there's nothing miraculous. You get a healthy one to begin with, mm -hmm. and then just feed it what you're supposed to. And I think it's like that with a lot of expert only fish. It's just a matter of like figuring out what does that fish really need to live long term? Because a lot of times, it's not something that's that hard to do. You know? So the analogy that I always use is just because a rabbit and a cat are small furry animals does not mean they ate the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I just have no idea what a rabbit would look like if you only fed it meat. <laughs> I, I just don't even know how that's going to pan out, man. <laughs> yeah, we do it in the aquarium all the time. And I watch, mm -hmm. if you go watch uh, the fish in the wild, you know, the yellow tang is not hunting down shrimp. No. You know, uh, certainly not freshwater shrimp. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just eating algae like all day long. And by, by accident, mm -hmm. it probably picks up some little micro crustaceans. <laughs> you know, it's just algae. So 100% of his diet is mm -hmm. carbohydrates and fiber, not all so dissimilar from the bunny. Yeah. Meanwhile, next to it is uh, this trigger fish, which mm -hmm. is like eating coral and stuff, you know. Uh, uh, and then next to that is like a you know, a Pareto proof fish, like a, you know, uh, like grouper a or something. grouper yeah. or like a long nose hawk fish, just sitting there waiting for a big meal. Mm -hmm. And then it's just fine sitting there for a long time again. Yep. Uh, and so these things are, uh, they eat only meat. You know what uh, this reminds me of is the, uh, when I sent you those cherry antheus years ago, and I was like, yeah, you can feed them like twice a week. They'll be fine. They eat big food. Mm -hmm. They're not like normal antheus, you know, it's, uh, one of those things like those fish come from deep water. They're meant to eat large particle food sizes, mm -hmm. uh, you know, full size krill, silver sides. Um, but if just because it's an anthias, you treat it like an anthias doesn't mean it's going to all behave the same. You no, know, there's no plankton on you know, the that deep. totally opposite end of the spectrum. It's like purple queen anthias, right? It's a great example. They eat microscopic little crustaceans floating around in the water, you know, both anthias. Yeah, but incredibly different dietary requirements. Mm -hmm. So I also think of uh, the uh, like uh, the twin sub gobies again, mm -hmm. like if I fed them the mice, they would actually go eat it. Mm -hmm. But if you actually look really close, they're just like trying to like desperately gum it, you know, <laughs> like they can't actually swallow this thing. They're like, I don't know what they're trying to do is like squeeze the juice out of it. Man. Like, I, but the reality is what those things do is they have a mouth and digestive mm -hmm. tract is designed to sift the sand for little tiny micro crustaceans. Mm -hmm. It is not designed to eat a big old shrimp, yeah. you know? Uh, and so when I was having success with them, what we were doing is spraying micro crustaceans and stuff into the sand in yeah. front of it. Uh, <laughs> you know, like we were just putting Kalanis and stuff and like even stuff like little tiny fish eggs and stuff that mm -hmm. a fish egg is 
the type of thing that would actually settle out in the sand and it probably would encounter to some degree in the wild. Um, I think this is, goes back to that point that we made earlier. It's like the fish, it's not that difficult. It's just that was a lot of work, right? But for the duration mm -hmm. that you were doing that, they were fine. Mm -hmm. But if you stopped, I'm sure they would probably perish shortly after. You know what, though? Actually, it wasn't the case. It was when the tank got more established mm -hmm. and there was mm -hmm. all of Natural the food. worms and stuff that got in there. Eventually, we didn't have to actually feed it yeah. every day the same way. Like the mandarin goby. But the problem was the other problem, which was the aggression. One day, we added a six-line <laughs> ras for the flatworms, mm -hmm. and that little bastard meant killed them. Mm -hmm. You know, they cared for those things. Every day, I was so excited. I'm so really proud that we'd taken this accomplishment. And then this, this fish that you wouldn't think would be able to kill anything, man, yeah. just harass them to death inside of like a day or two. Six lines, they're just, uh, they have a propensity to, to be incredibly aggressive for their size. Yeah, it is uh, amazing. Yeah. So replicate the natural diet. And like, I, I think of this all the time, like this is the, the part that frustrates me a little bit, mm -hmm. is that our hobbies behind the times. If you went back 20 years ago, everybody was using Meow Mix yeah. and Alley Cat mm -hmm. and whatever. I mean, that's what Nine Lives and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And you read the first ingredient on there and it's like, you know, I'm, I'm making this up, but like you know, <laughs> corn or wheat or whatever it might yeah. be. And then you go now look at today's foods and you pick up a bag of like blue buffalo or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. like those calibers of foods. And it's like chicken, number mm -hmm. one thing, you know, no. it's, you know, like act poultry and like it's actual things <laughs> that like the meat in this matter yeah. is the type of food that this thing would actually encounter. Now mm -hmm. it's in a dry pellet. Now there are also are canned foods, and now there's mm -hmm. also like, oh, I mean, they got, like throw the chicken gourmet, in the blender. Uh, you know, pet foods now. They, it looks like human foods. You could put it on a really nice plate and serve it up. You know. Okay, and, <laughs> and like this is totally anecdotal, and many of you have already heard this story before. But like I have my my cat, and mm -hmm. I started I started feeding him the blender chicken at mm -hmm. one point in time because I just felt like it was the right thing to do. Yeah. I felt like they you know beak and all, man, a little vitamin premix or whatever. Okay. I don't know, man, whether or not it was really healthier than, you know, feeding corn. I presume mm -hmm. so. Uh, but I can tell you this, he pooped twice or a half as much and it didn't stink anymore. Uh, I, I would say that that is a good sign for me that whatever we're feeding him, man, he's using more of it, yeah. you know. Uh, also, because it had all that water in it, it's better for his kidneys and stuff than yeah. the dry food as well. So, like, I knew that I was doing better. In this case, we're... We still have little bits of this because we knew at one point in time, brine shrimp was what everybody fed. And then every, at some mm -hmm. point we like definitively figured out that mysis shrimp has uh, more fat yeah. uh, content in it and energy. Yep. So we're willing to pay twice as much for that. And then eventually we figured out that like the Canadian, like the PE stuff <laughs> actually is even more than the average stuff. And so uh -huh. the PE stuff was the best and we migrated to that. But then there are also things out there like Rod's food mm -hmm. and there's things out there like uh, LRS or Larry's food. Oh. You know, like this is like the, th it's the future where I see like where the general pet industry because mm -hmm. like what I can say about most of those things is 100 percent of the ingredients in here came from the sea. Yeah. No terrestrial animals, mm -hmm. no terrestrial plants in here. Right. And they're optimized to the animal, even stuff like Hikari that well, says uh, for angels. What's oh, the number yeah, one ingredient yeah. in sponge. angel sponge? Mm -hmm. yeah. I thought it was marketing. I yeah. thought it was like, you're just trying to sell me some, you know, <laughs> some food for this uh, uh, fish, like more foods. Yeah. And the reality is no, it was actually curated to the animal's diet to eat sponge mm -hmm. all the time. So number one ingredient sponge, if you have angels, for gosh sake, feed that. Yeah. Um, yeah to your point about feeding stuff that they would naturally occur in uh, you know, their habitat, uh, the big one that I'm kind of, I don't like uh, is actually garlic. Mm -hmm. um, everyone likes to feed garlic. I don't know why. Like, garlic is not something that fish's bodies are meant to uh, process. I heard it attacks you know. their heart or something. Uh, I think long term it affects their kidneys. Kidneys, kidneys, yeah. I could be wrong. It was all presumed. Uh, uh, yeah. Like, plausible theory. Uh, this is one of the areas with plausible theory. Like, garlic, we're yeah. told, is good for us, must be good for the fish. When does a fish ever encounter garlic? You know, um, I think that it could be a useful tool. I don't think that it should be something that's a uh, long-term fed. Like if you have a finicky fish, maybe it's not taking the food. Sometimes having a little bit of garlic in there make the fish want to eat a little bit more, you know, a little bit uh, more enticing just based off smell. Um, but other than that, shouldn't really be eating it. 
I, I think this down the board, the closer that you get to this animal's natural diet, probably the better that it will do. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions I get asked all the time is, well, man, how could I stop my tanks from eating the shrimp? And the answer is you can't, <laughs> but you can provide the things that it does mm -hmm. need as well, which is clip in that nori, put in the LG Extreme pellets in the auto feeder. And mm -hmm. what I have, instead of like dumping a bunch of LG Extreme pellets in there all the time, they're like in a huge swath of them, it feeds just like little bits of it by the hour. Yeah. So just a tiny, tiny amount goes in there every single hour because they're mm -hmm. grazing and eating this stuff all day long, not in like big batches of it per se. You know, uh, I think one of the uh, things that we don't recognize is in the ocean, the fish are eating constantly, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they always have food available to them, but in a tank once a day in the morning, twice a day in the morning at night, um, I mean, tanks are grazing every hour, you know, miles of the reef. Antheas are eating constantly, you know, every couple minutes less. Um, and I think that there's got to be a way to replicate that either with auto feeders, but like it would be so cool if you could do that with frozen food. Imagine that. That would be so cool. You know what I think might be the bridge gap here mm. that uh, like I've been thinking about in the background a lot is liquid foods. <laughs> right, liquid foods and dosers. And one of the things mm -hmm. I've been told, and I haven't confirmed this, uh, but I've been told that things like those liquid foods that NIOS makes, mm -hmm. uh, even though it says on there, a refrigerator after opening, that it's actually preserved well as long as you don't contaminate it. Uh, mm -hmm. And so if we could get cool. liquid foods like, because they have uh, like essentially mysis shrimp in there and they mm -hmm. have colanis and they have yeah. other types of foods. And then you could have, the, it's, like, it's almost like the, the canned food of, uh, mm -hmm. of uh, like the dog cat, uh, dog and cat yeah. world, where it's meat-like, but shelf stable, <laughs> right? Uh, okay, in this case, then I could dose, using a dosing pump, if I sterilize the lines, mm -hmm. uh, and I could dose, you know, yeah. non-dried foods that way. Uh, and then like, you know, the algae and stuff, I'm perfectly okay with feeding those algae pellets. It yeah. doesn't have to come in a nori. and the, I think most of the them tearing it off of the rock um, is for my own enjoyment. You know what? A uh, good trick with nori um, is if you take a sheet of it. I mean, uh, at the shop we use the, like 12 by 12 sheets. Um, but if you wet it a little bit and then you roll it uh, and then rubber band that to like a rock or piece of PVC or something, that way the fish can actually just take a full bite of nori, but they can't actually rip off the full sheet because it's rolled up. Actually, I, you, I just thought of another one that you told me. <laughs> How many of us you feed clams on the half, half shell? Tell us why you should. Uh, because it's incredibly nutrient dense and it's like perfect ratio. I mean, clams like superfood for fish. Uh, also, if you have finicky fish, particularly with like angelfish, regals, uh, they take to it right away. The only thing though is uh, they don't like ones with freezer burn mm. it'll like train them not to eat it oh really to that point yeah so where um, do you get your clams in the house uh, shell from i actually go to like seafood market um i buy manila clams we probably go through i don't know maybe like 15 pounds of clams a month okay. um yeah no clams are an enormous part of like my personal fish's diet um yeah like the 900 at the shop i'm feeding a dozen clams a day you know big ones uh the thing about them though, you have to freeze them because they do have worms and flukes and parasites and stuff. Frozen solid 48 hours, they're good to go. So what comes to mind is uh, I've seen this at uh, like, there's better ways to do this at the fish store and worse mm -hmm. ways. So if you go to the fish store and it has a freezer that opens like this, the moment you open it, all the cold air just rushes out the bottom. <laughs> uh, and then you close it. And that's and not really designed to be open and closed in most cases, those mm -hmm. types of freezers. Like, a chest freezer is yeah, better. Like, you know, every 10 yeah. minutes, it's really hard to maintain a temperature that way. So a chest freezer where you open mm -hmm. it up and all the cold air stays in there uh, is better. But also, if it looks like the refrigerator came from, uh, like, you know, uh, just your average thing that you would buy for your garage. Mm -hmm. It's not designed to be opened up and closed 60 times a day as people, you know, yeah. uh, come in and buy fish food. So uh, you would, I could actually look at the freezer and tell you whether or not the food is freezer burned inside just by what you chose yeah. to freeze it in. 
Well, so the thing about like when you go get live clams from like a seafood market, they're still alive and they're sealed in the shell. Right. And when it freezes, it's not exposed to the air and it's wet inside. And then when you thaw it, it's actually frozen water inside there most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just like, of course, it's not going to get freezer burn because it's not exposed to the air. One yeah. of the cool things about clam, clams in the half shell mm -hmm. was you, you told me when you, they, the big fish come in, tear it out, and they, you know, like mm -hmm. pit bull it. <laughs> uh, and, and then what happens after that is all the little bits go oh, yeah. out, and then what happens? Yep, all the small fish. <laughs> they get all the particle sizes they need. Okay, and that's exactly like when I'm snorkeling, what you see is mm -hmm. if somebody finds a big meal all of a sudden. Oh, yeah, all the small fish it, race in. Yeah, then yeah. all of a sudden, man, all the other fish are right mm -hmm. around, man, picking up all the scraps. Yep. I mean, you so. see it with the lions and the hyenas. <laughs> you know, like it's just true in nature. Yeah. So uh, if you haven't tried feeding clams in the mm -hmm. shell, consider oh, it. Oh, yeah, definitely try it. All right. Another one, top 10 fish keeping tricks, man, is proper quarantine. I mean, like <laughs> this is hard to encapsulate inside of a tip, but what do you mean? Uh, you know what? We're going to step outside of like quarantining with medications just for a moment. But I think that if let's just say that you get a fish, whether it's healthy or not, I think that it is always a good idea to have that fish in a separate tank where you can observe it, get it eating, uh, make sure it's not disease ridden just so you're not infecting your tank. Um, but it's a great time to just watch the fish before you put it into the general populace, not just because it's got disease, because it might have other things, you know, maybe it's uh, sensitive fish like a copper band and it needs like 10 days before it's going to start eating, you know, um, then you can train it. And then by the time that it gets in the tank, maybe you've had it for two months and it's actually eating aggressively now and it's eating out of the water column, um, you know, stuff like that. It just, uh, goes a long way. Uh, I, I think even past that is the real actual quarantine. If you haven't watched the 80, 20 method, man, it, oh, yeah. it looks like this. We, put we, put we the covered. fish in there, man. Uh, let it was like a few days. Mm -hmm. Change out the water 100%. Repeat that like five times, man. You're done. Mm -hmm. uh, it, this is not a super difficult task. Yeah. You don't really even have to have like a biological filter in there. Yeah. Like, Air stone, uh, heater. Dude, it's so easy. It's super, super, mm -hmm. super simple. To, and it will be effective on a lot of different things. Like you've 80 20 this. There's still yeah, like 20% yeah. risk, man, but you removed the other 80. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. And, and, and actually the ease too, man, is like 80% of the benefit, 20% of the effort. Yeah. Uh, so proper quarantine, you probably go watch that. Uh, and uh, I think there's, it's probably the easiest possible way to grasp yeah. because most of the other content out there gets lost in the nerdy elements of it. Yeah. Well, so uh, I don't know, maybe observation is better, uh, but like I always tell people, even when they buy fish from us, like or a commercial facility, nothing's 100% best practice always observe the fish just mm -hmm. just to be safe because why not right wouldn't it be so much better if something happened and it was isolated not in your main display tank um, you know and then on top of it you can let it recover from shipping you know you can get it feeding you can get it adjusted and it's strong healthy ready to go fish opposed to okay well it just got thrown around in a box by FedEx for a little while then it's got or it was in the dark now it's in the bright light you know you have all these changes that affect fish and it's like okay well we could just do a couple other things have vast amount more of uh, success okay this one here i just snuck a peek at it right <laughs> so uh this is the next one which is i think number nine and it's kind of takes all the things we just said and builds it into one which is uh fish are living things mm -hmm. treat them as such yeah. as a tip You'd be more successful, you know, caring for them if you did. Yeah, it's, um, I'm trying to figure, or, uh, figure the right way to phrase this. I think a lot of the times we think of the fish as just objects that we're putting into a nice display, a piece of furniture type of thing, not so much animals in the same way that we consider them a dog, cat, you know, something that's a family member. But I think that the amount of work that you're willing to do and the amount of uh, effort that we put forth for those pet type animals uh, should be applied with fish. You know, I mean, why not? If you're going to keep it, it's a living thing. If you're going to take it out of the ocean, you might as well give it a good home. You know, this is the part that, that kind of makes me boil a little bit, which is, <laughs> yeah, like 
the fish are just kind of treated by many people as it's like a throwaway item mm -hmm. and live, replaceable. Live, who cares? Uh, and then when they die, oh, I don't know, fish just die. It's yeah. the evil in the tank or some crazy, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> like, it's not true, man. You did something wrong. Yeah. You know, something here wrong, it's preventative. And by throwing it off and just shrugging it off, it's ensuring that everybody that comes after us is going to have the same damn problem. No. Right? Mm -hmm. Or we could look at it and say, nope, not evil in the tank. Uh, it was nutrition, aggression, mm -hmm. you know, parasites. It was something. So uh, this is probably the most offensive thing that I could possibly say, <laughs> right? Uh, which is like, if you knew somebody that was burning through puppies the way that some people burn through fish, man, you would be appalled. That person should not have puppies, man. Yeah. Uh, and it's not to say that like uh, we're not going to make mistakes and so be it, you know, because this is real. Mm -hmm. But we shouldn't take them flippantly. It is a yeah. sentient being. It's an animal that, mm -hmm. you know, we took out of its home and brought it into our home. And if we care for it, we'll be more successful. By successful, I mean, I spent a bunch of money on that to, because it's beautiful and cool. I want it to be beautiful and cool and alive. Mm -hmm. uh, if know, I care about that, <clears throat> you'll care about me. Yeah, you know, I, I think there's something to be said. Like if you go in, onto a healthy reef and you actually see the fish in the wild, in their habitat, and you actually see what they're supposed to look like, then you look at the fish that are in most tanks, it's not even the same animal. You know, um, and I think that we should definitely strive to be a lot more, um, how should I say, uh, a lot closer to replicating what they would have in the wild and what their natural needs are opposed to, you know, this is just going to have the fish live or survive opposed to thrive. Okay, so again, twin spot goby, mm -hmm. right? This morning, man, we were talking about the twin spot goby again. And we were talking about what substrate it starts, it lives in. Cause I was telling them the first one it had oh, it, yeah. it didn't work cause the, the rocks were too big. You know, it was like a natural kind of uh, stuff that came out of Florida and it was actually bigger than you would think. It wasn't like that oolite stuff. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, then you said, Google it <laughs> and go to hit the images. And so I hit the image tab and then you can actually just watch or look and see where this mm -hmm. thing lives. Because yeah, there's tons and tons of natural footage or, or, uh, uh, and, and photos of these things in their natural environment. So if you mm -hmm. got a fish and you're wondering where it lives and what it does, man, just Google it, especially the natural geographic type stuff. Uh, <laughs> and you can just watch. It's like, ah, that's its behavior. Mm -hmm. That's where it likes to go in and out of. That's what it looks like it's eating. That's the grain size of sand that it lives yep. in. Whatever it does, that's its natural behavior. Well, let's fit that. Mm -hmm. Instead of watching how it functions at a, you know your fish store or your buddy Jerry's house, because uh, <laughs> it might just be tolerating that, which is different mm -hmm. than optimizing to its actual environment. Yeah. Interesting. Number 10, uh, less food is actually more of a feeding response. I don't think many people think this. Okay. So this one is usually more for finicky fish. Uh, but a lot of times when you feed a fish, just dump a bunch of food in there, you know, you get this little confetti cloud of food. Um, try feeding like one singular mice shrimp. If a fish is like finicky, like cop band or regal angel or Moorish idol, a lot of times, if there's only one food item to look at, that's what they're going to focus on. They'll lock in on it and they'll actually like come over and look at it. But if it's, you know, this big cloud, it's a little bit too overstimulating. Um, and also the fact that like fish's mind is meant to think, OK, well, uh, I'm in scarcity mode. I need to know that I'm going to eat as much as I can when I can. So if there's a limited amount, it immediately makes that fish think, OK, well, that's all that's there. I better eat it. You know, opposed to, OK, there's all this fish there's all, or all this food. There's all this distraction, there's food everywhere. Eh, I'm probably not going to try because I can't focus on any single one. Yep. So mm -hmm. sometimes the scarcity will cause it yeah. to go for the bite in a way that it's abundance. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the top 10 fish uh, keeping tricks. Uh, if you want to see more videos like this one with Elliot, because I got a bunch of pile of them sitting right over there that we're going to be <laughs> shooting. Uh, if you want to see those things, uh, hit the subscribe, man, because uh, we release this stuff every week. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll see you in the next one. Thanks for joining us.